Welcome back, young disciples, to our second try at Deep Bible Study for our virtual camp. That during this uh, hour, the internet for Inshalim was fixed, and I think it's going to be working just fine, so I'm happy about that. Uh, you may or may not have heard Miss Zita pray for us last hour, but we're going to play that prayer again. So let's bow our heads and we'll have Miss Zita pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the wonderful blessings you have given us. We come to you this morning asking that you put your Holy Spirit on our speaker today. Please give him the right words so that they may bring us closer to you and help us to have patience during this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for help hearing and answering our prayers. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Miss Zita, for praying for us in the time of the pandemic. So today, we're going to be talking about yesterday's assignment that was doing the cross-referencing uh, uh, study. And I got so many people who turned in their assignments. So I'm just going to read you a few of them. If you were here last hour and heard the chop, 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 uh, I'm just going to do it over, right? Because I think it didn't come through very well. Mr. Nathan was studying. And he found in his cross-references Psalm 5 and Exodus 23. And he found that when we call on God, he will answer us. Now, if you wanted to do a deep study, you could study when does God answer prayers and when does he not? Because that perplexes lots of people. But for sure, we're finding in many prayers, in many places in the Bible, that he does hear our prayer. Then we have Ophelia. She found that beautiful Psalm 91 is a cross-reference to Psalm 46. She said, when we dwell in God, he will be our refuge and fortress, which means that he will take care of us. When we know that he is caring for us, we need not fear. That's true, isn't it? That people are so afraid, and yet if they only could keep in mind that they have someone to protect them. You know, I like repelling. I can't stand the idea of going down a steep rock face without rock, without ropes, but I like repelling. Well, what's the difference? The difference is I know I'm being taken care of when I have that repelling gear. And the same way we know that God will protect us when we're connected to him properly. Then we have Lucas. He found Zechariah 3.17 and Psalm 48.9 as cross-references. He said when God is in the midst of us, he is there because of his love for us. He is there to take care of us. It's not in a negative way that he is in the midst of us. But that's true. You could have parasites. You could have tapeworms in the midst of you. You could have roundworms in the midst of you. You could have trichinosis worms in the midst of you. The fact that something's in the midst of you is no evidence that it's helping you. I mean, people can even be demon possessed, can't they? But why and how is it that God is in the midst of us? That's because of love. That's what was found by Mr. Lucas, a very profound idea. Then Zach found Exodus 14. He said, God will always save us, even if he has to move mountains. And we talked a couple of days ago about some of those mountains that young people might face, that God might take care of. Good point, Mr. Zach. Then Daniel studied, and he found Jeremiah 29 and Isaiah 55. He said, God has plans different to ours, although they may not make sense to us, and we may not like them. You know, I was stuck in South Africa for three months. It was not my plan. And if you had asked me, asked my wife where she wanted to be for three months away from Malaysia, she might have listed 50 countries before she got to South Africa. It might be all the countries she could think of, because that was not it. But when we were there, God put us with the sweetest family in the nicest place, able to minister in many opportunities that we had there, speaking to several different groups of people. I was even able to speak by Zoom to a group in China who had as a leader a South African pastor. So it's true that God's plans and our plans might not be the same, but God's plans are great. Thank you, Daniel. And Savannah found Psalm 91 and said, God can and will protect us from Satan and all other things that could harm us when we call on him. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk more about that, Savannah, when I get to the snake, because, yeah, I will. 
And then Carice found Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 12 and Isaiah 5, a lot of Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah 2 and 5. She wrote, often the people who seem to be up there doing good in a worldly sense will be brought down and the Lord will be exalted. That's true. I can think in our Adventist history of a number of very successful people who ended up making a a shipwreck of their life. If you did a word study in Ellen White's writings for the word shipwreck, you'd find a lot of references to the danger of people who have a, you know, a Titanic can have a shipwreck just like a rowboat can have a shipwreck. And the fact that you're a big boat doesn't protect you from shipwrecks. So thank you for that thought, Miss Carice. Then Caleb was studying and he found that the question is, which cross references did you study? And he wrote all of them, which means Caleb probably spent a lot of time in his Bible study. And he said, what is one thing you learned from your study? And what he wrote is that cross referencing is fun and very helpful. Super. I hope you learned that too, that using cross, uh, when I began to use cross references, I found it was fun this way. It was fun to discover things. It was fun to find verses that worked like keys into other verses and explain themselves so well. Where, like, better than I ever heard in sermons. I found the Bible was better than sermons. That's what I learned. Okay, and then one more, Ethan. Uh, he found in Psalm 91, if we are with God, we don't have anything to fear. I said one more, but I just see there's not just one more. There's several more. And so I just want to give a shout out to Jenna and Matthew and Joy and Adriana and say, I'm glad you did your studies. You found really important things. And uh, I think I need to get to my deep Bible study for today. So I'm going to do that. Let me make sure my notes are on the back of one of them. There they are on the back of this one. So first, I'm going to tell you the story. Yesterday, I was walking down towards Earth Lodge when I heard two juncos that just seemed obsessed with a clump of grass. And there was an old dead uh, pine branch on that grass. And they would keep landing on the low branches of that pine branch. And then they would dive at the grass and come back up. And they were making, you know, the way juncos make a distrust call as they clip their beaks together, click, 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 click. And they do it really hard. And both mom and dad Junko were making loud click sounds continuously when I was at a big distance. And I came closer, closer, and closer to get pictures. I moved around to get the sun on the right side, and I got some good pictures. And I was just there for five or ten minutes because while I was there watching this strange behavior, I thought I was going to see a baby Junko. I thought maybe there were fledglings that had like left a nest and were in the grass somewhere. I was waiting for them to kind of pop up, but they never did. And while I was waiting, some other birds came. It was so interesting. Uh, two pygmy nuthatches came right to that same tree. And then a white-breasted nuthatch came to the tree. And then a, a, a Pacific Slope flycatcher came to the tree. And more than two different hummingbirds came to the tree. And there, there were quite a number of birds that came, and, and I remember the most interesting of all of them, they all seemed to be looking at the grass, but the most investigative was a mountain chickadee. The mountain chickadees are the ones that have the little white lines right here on the top of their head, going kind of going this way. Other chickadees have lines going other ways, but the mountain chickadee came, and he landed on those same branches looking down in that grass, and it made me curious. So I decided to see if I could see at a different angle. And as I moved a little bit, I saw the gleam of scales. And I looked in closer, moved around, and I saw a pretty good sized snake wrapped around a nest. And I could see a baby bird in the nest in the middle of the snake coils. And now I knew what was going on. And so I went and took a big branch and I began to harass the snake and it hissed at me. And it moved a bit, and eventually it moved, and it was about, I, I'm estimating now, because I just saw it again a few minutes ago, probably about five and a half feet long. And uh, that little snake finally got off his, his prize, and I chased him down the hill, and I came back, and I found three baby birds in the nest, and they were all dead. 
that was two baby juncos and one baby brood parasite, probably a cowbird, and uh, just all dead. And the mother and the father junco were still distressed and chill calling at their babies. I didn't tell you, but I saw something I didn't mention, but the mother junco went hunting and dropped food down into the nest area for the babies, even while the snake was still there. Probably it had been an hour since she could feed them and she knew the babies would be hungry by now and she couldn't get to them, but she still, I saw her grab a, a bug, chew it all up and make it really soft and gooey, then come right over and just drop it right into that grassy area. Well, you might wonder what lesson you can learn from such a sad story as that. And uh, let me show you that uh, bird. I mean, it's not the bird, I'll show you the snake. He's a bull snake, let me try it. Here we go. I'll do this, here we go, share. Whoop. There, can you see it? Are you looking at it? Uh, okay, it's something to do. So what you're looking at there is a bull snake. And can they see my little uh, mark? Can you see the cursor? If you look in the middle of the bull snake, you see that bulge right there that I'm circling? That bulge is probably a baby junco. And uh, probably he ate one before I interrupted him. And now let's see if I can stop the share. Whoop. So uh, I began thinking a lot about that experience after I saw him. And I began thinking about how much care and sympathy all the birds of the forest had for the distress calls of the juncos. You know, those juncos were calling out in distress. And all I did is I just kind of watched like a curious bystander, but the other birds came to see if they could help. And I hope that we can learn something from the other birds that when someone's in distress, that we're going to show that we care. Of course, those birds were powerless to change anything. They couldn't like chase away the snake, but they showed their concern. And you know, when your neighbors have distress, when one of them loses his job or one of his children dies or is diagnosed with cancer, something terrible happens to him, you probably can't fix the cancer, you can't give him his job back, you can't bring his children back to life, but do you think you could be as kind as the birds and show that you care? And one thing I saw that I noticed, and I, I wanna thank uh, one of our campers here about this, Miss Alana, is that these birds that were showing concern, they weren't juncos. That is, they were showing concern for a distress call from a bird that was very different from them that didn't look like them, that didn't talk like them, that didn't even have the same distress call as them, and they still showed concern. And here in the United States, there's a lot of, a lot of issue right now about race and, and race riots and concern about inequality and prejudice. And I hope one thing we can learn from these birds is when we show compassion, we're gonna show compassion for whoever is in distress. It doesn't matter how they look, however much different from us, however similar to us, however much they sound similar or different to us, we could learn a lot. Well, let me tell you, today, during our intermission between our deep Bible study attempt and our real deep Bible study now, I was outside when I heard a strangely familiar sound. I heard a psh, psh, psh. It was the sound of the hissing snake. I recognized it from yesterday. And I went to look and see. And what I saw, I didn't see anything on the ground. I was looking there first, but I looked up and I saw an active squirrel. And then I saw the snake and the squirrel were right together on a tree. It was the same snake. And I went closer and I saw that the squirrel and the snake were bothering each other. And the squirrel was jumping around and biting the snake. Literally, like, like the snake would be going around the tree and the, the squirrel would chase its tail and bite its tail. And really that squirrel was really annoying the snake and the snake went out on a limb and the squirrel chased it out into the limb. And at that time, Mr. Tony came, Mr. Tony Everett. So he had his little phone there. I don't know if he got a picture good enough to see, but he came out there with his phone. He saw both the squirrel and the snake. And then I looked back when we came close, the snake couldn't move. He was really stuck in the tree, but the squirrel retreated. And I looked back to where the squirrel was and right behind the squirrel, was a hole this big in the tree. So what do you think? Mr. Bullsnake was going after more babies. 
He went after baby birds yesterday. And what was he after today? Baby squirrels. And what did that squirrel do? That squirrel risked its life to defend its babies. It really risked its life. I mean, I think that's, that those, those snakes, those, uh, I just forgot what he was called. Bull snakes are powerful constrictors. They could certainly kill a squirrel, a live adult squirrel, but that squirrel to save its babies was just staying right nearby. I'm sure if that squirrel just run away that that snake would have eaten all the babies. But it came and it looks like it was having success keeping that snake at a distance. Well, I see there something that reminds me, young disciples, of your parents. I think your parents are working so hard to make sure you get to heaven. I'm sure that the devil sometimes comes right into your home, right by your hole in the tree. He comes right there, maybe through the phones or maybe through other media or through people that visit. I'm sure the devil is not any day going to be leaving babies alone. If he's going after baby birds yesterday, it's baby squirrels today. And aren't you glad you have parents that have worked so hard to scare him away? Parents that have taken a cost and gone after that. Well, anyway, so, so I'm going to give, I'm going to make a story about that and put it on my YouTube channel sometime. And maybe today I'll do that because I just think it's a lesson people need to hear. But now let me go to our deep Bible study. So I today was studying the word war. And I did what I told you about, how I often do. I often go to the very end of the Bible and kind of work backwards. And I found a number of passages related to war in the Bible. One of them was Revelation 19.19. 19. And if you have your Bibles with you, why don't you turn there with me? Revelation chapter 19 and verse 19. Well, look at this. We have most of our panelists back. So I'm just so glad the panelists came back for a late deep Bible study. It says, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And so what's the result of this war? Everyone's against King Jesus and us. Look at verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword comes out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. What an interesting story. So there's going to be, we call this battle Armageddon. And this battle is going to be a battle that ends in the complete discomfiture. That is the complete destruction of the enemy forces. The humans are going to die and the devils are going to be taken captive for a thousand years. Now, did you notice in those verses we just read about that war? Who is deceived? And on the wrong side. Well, it doesn't say who, but it says how. It says they were deceived by the miracles that he did. The miracles that people see today are moving them the wrong direction. People see miracles, they see healing, they see amazing things, and it moves them the wrong direction. And we want to watch out for that. So then I went back a little bit. Uh, in the same chapter, I went back to verse 11. That was a cool sound. Look back to verse 11. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. You see that. They're fighting against Jesus, but there's something interesting about this war. And it's going to be part of our study this morning. Does Jesus fight in wars? Well, he does in chapter 19. He does. But his wars are never wars of selfishness. They're never wars of self-aggrandizement. He's not trying to get other people's stuff. His wars aren't the same as these human wars. In truth and righteousness, he makes war. Like that first war in Revelation 12, where he, there was war in heaven, right? And then later in chapter 12, when he makes war against the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. 
the reason I'm looking at these war stories is because I want to understand in Psalm 46, it says he's going to bring war to the end. Have you seen it there in Psalm 46 that he says, look at the works of the Lord. Look, look what God does. If you were here on YD campus, and you wanted to look at what Caleb and Christian do. You might see that they play a really interesting piano duet. Like if they're going to show off something they do, maybe they'd show you their piano duet. And if you're going to look at something that uh, Miss Hannah does, you might look at her uh, rock for the Truth Rocks rock. Maybe you'll see a picture of that. That's an amazing picture I saw that she'd drawn. That like sometimes we like to show the things we put a lot of work into. But what about if God wants to show what he's done? You know what he shows off in Psalm 46? It's that he brings wars to an end. He stops wars. He breaks the bow. That's what he does. And that led me to a question. It leads me to the question, should Adventists be involved in war? Now, uh, Ivor Myers, he has a group that he calls the Army. And, but you probably know that that's like spiritual battle, right? That's like praying. They're not talking about how to use AK-47s and karate and, you know, using swords, literal ones. But what about it, what about if you really admire those really strong, big muscle, handsome rangers or the uh, other special forces, the Green Berets? Should you get involved in the military? I was uh, speaking to a group of seniors just over a week ago, and one of those, one of the students at that school has as his ambition, or had a week ago anyway, two weeks ago, his ambition was to become part of those special forces. And you know what they train those special forces to do? They train them how to kill. They train them so that if someone comes up behind you and starts to make a move to hurt you, you can instantly respond and maybe you'll kill him before he kills you. They're trained in the art of of uh, purposeful murder. Now think about what Jesus said. He said that if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. This brings us to one of our principles about how to study the Bible. So I'll preach about it for a moment and then I'll go on with my study. Because when I was in South Africa, I was speaking to a group of pastors. And those pastors had taken theology courses. And I'm afraid some of you might take theology courses someday. And, uh, and in their theology course, they were taught an idea about Bible study that I think is really dangerous. And they were taught to get the idea out of the text itself without comparing it to other passages. To get it out of that passage just itself before you go anywhere else. And since the Bible wasn't made for that, I don't think it works well. But you know what happens when a man wants to get the truth out of the passage, but he can only read the passage so many times. So now he ends up going to Bible dictionaries and Bible encyclopedias and Bible commentaries about that passage to try to get as much out of the passage as he can. So if he's studying something in Matthew, he doesn't let Ezekiel explain it to him. Jeremiah doesn't explain it to him. Isaiah doesn't explain it. Paul doesn't explain it. Uh, Jesus doesn't explain it, but he might let one of those theologians explain it. So I was telling them that, no, the Bible wasn't made that way. I was speaking to all the pastors in that conference. I talked about Isaiah 28 and how we need to compare scripture with scripture, like I shared with you. And oh, what made some of them quite upset. And uh, one of them raised his hand and I called on him. And he said that you, he was trying to show that you need commentaries. And he said that when you study Matthew chapter 5, you'll find that when Jesus said, it, when they smite you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also, that that was an idiom, an old Greek idiom for standing up for yourself. The pastor was saying that Jesus was really saying that you, if someone hits you, put your dukes up. He was saying you, you got to stand for yourself. And that's what it, 
And he was saying that people who don't use commentaries would never discover the meaning of the idiom. So I just began to remind him about some of the things in the context of that verse that says, if they smite you on the one cheek, turn to them the other also. Uh, in the very same context, Jesus said to love your enemies. He said to do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Uh, he said to resist not evil. Those ideas are right together in Matthew 5. And when you put those ideas together, what do you get? And what I said is, Pastor, how do you know that the man that made that reference book that you were reading, how do you know that he didn't have an agenda? How do you know that he wasn't being affected by his agenda? Because you know there is, uh, there are a group of people in academia that have an agenda to say that we should stand up and fight for our rights. And there's a group of people in academia who are representing many of the, well, the LGBT community, and uh, I don't need to make a list. I could get myself in trouble in North America these days. But anyway, you don't know when you're reading reference materials, Bible commentaries and such things, and dictionaries and encyclopedias, if maybe the author of that dictionary or that encyclopedia might be putting his own ideas in. And this is why I want to be sure that we compare scripture with scripture. That we take one part of the Bible and compare it to another. So let's talk a little bit more about this war issue for a minute. Because I think you could face it. Like if Americans trying to go to war, then a lot of you are coming up to the age where you could possibly face a draft. You know, We don't know what the future holds. Uh, wars and rumors of wars, it sounds like both. Um, so, if you were an Amish person, you would not go to the draft if there was a draft. You wouldn't sign up for the draft. That is, you wouldn't do your legal duty. If you're an Amish person, you would reason like this. You would say that if I work as a medic in the military, I'm helping that war, I'm helping the army. And those people that I stitch up and help them get better. They might be going out and killing people. So even though I'm working to heal, I'm really causing people to die. That's how the Amish would reason. You know why I don't reason that way? It's because of what Jesus said when he said, if someone compels you to go a mile, go with them too. He was talking there, of course, about Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers were in the minority in the New Testament times. And if they had a bunch of stuff to carry, that they were allowed by Roman law to make anyone they came in contact with to stop whatever he was doing and carry their stuff for a mile. Pick up a pack and carry it. Roman soldiers could do that. And what Jesus said is if a Roman soldier needs help and he asks you to go a mile, you can go two miles. That is, you can volunteer. Now, was the Roman army a good, righteous army fighting righteous wars? What do you think? No. I mean, the Roman government killed Jesus, and they killed Paul, and they ended up in the fourth century trying to annihilate all the Christians in the whole empire, from 303 to 313. They certainly weren't a righteous nation. And yet Jesus and Paul said we should pay taxes to them. And Jesus said, if they ask you to go a mile, go with them too. Here's how I understand that. If I find someone who's drunk laying beside the gutter and he's covered with filth and mud and vomit, I can clean him up and help him and take care of his wounds and give him a talk and try to help him even though I don't know him. Is it possible that when, that when he's sober, he might go and get drunk again and drive a car and kill somebody? Is that possible? But if he does that, is it my fault or his fault? Well, of course, that's his fault, right? But we can't make, I can't make those decisions for him. I'm responsible to be helpful. Then there's more in Matthew 5. Jesus said, 
that the Father in heaven sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Think about that. That means that God who sends the sun and the rain is giving the very things that are needed to support life on earth. Well, what's alive on earth? There are good people like you on earth, and there are bad people on earth. We know some bad people. We know of some bad people. And uh, does that mean that when those bad people do bad things that God's responsible? No, that was their choice. He supported them and gave them freedom. And we can support the government and give the government freedom. We can pay our taxes. We can take care of hurting people and give them freedom. And if the government requires me to enter the military and I uh, enter, I'm not going to break God's law, so I'm not going to carry a gun. I'm not going to, uh, going to work on Sabbath for any secular need. But I can work as a medic. And I'm not responsible for what the military does. I'm not responsible. So for the same reason, uh, I think that as an Adventist, you could be an attorney. You could be maybe a lawyer. But I think you probably wouldn't want to be the president of the United States. Do you know why? Because the president authorizes the killing of people. And whenever the American military is going to make a strike in another country without permission from that country, the president has to authorize it. So when we killed that high-ranking general in Iran a number of months ago, President Trump had to do that. There's no one else in the U.S. government with authority to authorize something like that. He's the only one that can do it. And so I wouldn't want the position of having my hand, as it were, on the trigger of authorizing people to kill. So what I'm trying to say to you is in Psalm 46, God says, look what I'm doing. I'm bringing war to an end. And if God is trying to bring war to an end, I think you can see that we wouldn't want to make it a career. We wouldn't want to be a, a soldier for hire, a mercenary. Someone said to me, but what if I join the military as a medic? What if I volunteer? Now, let me speak to that in a minute, then we'll get back to our Bible study. I can't speak for other countries. Maybe not all of you are in the United States. But in the United States, if you volunteer to join the military, you can't be a conscientious objector. You can't say, I won't carry a gun if you volunteer. The way the military sees it is that if you volunteered, you obviously aren't a conscientious objector. And th that's their view of the thing. So I would say, no, you better not. They say, but my recruiter promised me that I would have Sabbaths off and I wouldn't never have to go to training for guns. Hey, listen, that recruiter lies through his or her teeth. Recruiters do that routinely. I mean, I don't know the one you're talking to. But I've been around this world for a while, and I've just seen enough evidence that recruiters say whatever they have to say to get you to sign on the dotted line. They just do. Okay, well, I'm going to get in trouble for this, I know. So here we go. So I was studying war, and when I studied war, I found an interesting connection. Why don't you turn your Bibles with me to Revelation 17, and we're going to compare 17 to 13. Turn to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, and looking at verse 14, it says, now I haven't let our panelists say anything. Is there any panelists who'd like to read that verse 14 for us? Just so at least I can give you a chance to do something. All right, go ahead, Mr. Jonathan. Jonathan Alberts, right? Go ahead. Oh, okay. 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 These shall make war with the Lamb. The Lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Thank you very much. Did I get it backwards? Are you Nathaniel instead? Well, anyway, thank you for reading the verse to us. 
And um, what I want you to see there in chapter 17 is that people attack King Jesus, but do they win? No, they lose. But contrast that with chapter 13. Look back at 13, verse 17. Remember, just one page back for you. 13, verse 17, speaking about the time of, did I write that right? I'm sorry, it's 13, 7. It's 13, 7, not 13, 17. 13, 7. It says, and it was given unto the beast to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So in verse 7, when the beast fights against God's people, who wins? It's the beast. What we have here, when we compare these two wars, are two wars that involve the same individuals. In chapter 13, it's the beast and the evil people against Jesus and the righteous people. In chapter 17, it's Jesus and the righteous people against the beast and the evil people. Two wars, the same people, but they don't have the same outcome. That During the Middle Ages and even now, sometimes God's people, sometimes we lose. I, will that do it? That was Mr. Ted you just saw run right behind. Wasn't that great to see his uh, mid-body there for a moment? And uh, so we're talking about these two wars. And I want you to think it through that before wars end, there's going to be a change. That right now, it can seem like God's people are having the lower hand. It, like it, when I think about uh, parts of the Middle East and Somalia right now, it looks to me like, like God's people are really being beat up. But when I think about some other parts of the world, I can see it. When I think right now about uh, on the coast, the uh, east coast of Africa, there are a number of areas there that are uh, very much Islamic, south of Somalia. And very few people are working there trying to do anything. But those that are, some of them have no support. Uh, that is, it looks like that people... God's people don't always have the upper hand here on planet Earth. So I was very excited to find chapter 17, where you find that there's a change, that God is going to bring war to an end. Before he does, he's going to win. That's, I don't know if you've ever played a game like that, but sometimes you'll have someone who they play a game and they lose and they lose and they lose, but when they win, they're done. They're not going to play anymore. Have you ever played a game like that? Because they want to end winning. Well, I don't know if that's a good sport, but I tell you, it's a good illustration. It illustrates what God is doing. He doesn't always win the little battles here. Sometimes people join Satan's side, and, and God doesn't force them to come his way. But in the final picture, he's going to win. War is going to end. There's going to be no more fighting. Satan started the war, and... There's going to be an end to it made by God. Hey, I'm thankful for that. Let me review for you the things we've talked about and then send you to do your deep Bible study challenge. But what we've talked about today is that it's important that we do compare Scripture with Scripture. It's important that we look around to see what we can find. And that sometimes when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we might be launched into a topic that's practical. Like my topic of war launched me into the practical question of what to do in the draft and what to do about police work for Christians. You want to be ready and willing to let God guide you in your study to practical solutions. But I want to say in my last minute a couple more things. Because in, the, in my talk with young disciples here, I learned that one of them had used a marginal reading. And I think that uh, something I haven't mentioned yet, if you have a study Bible, your marginal readings could really help you. What is a marginal reading? It's a reading that shows you what the text could say when it's not clear. So the translators aren't sure which way is right, so they'll put one in the text and one in the margin. That can help you a lot with difficult passages of Scripture. And then this morning, the young disciples that were sharing, and kind of like our unit family sharing, 
some of them were quoting from Ellen White. And I'll say, never use Ellen White as a substitute for Bible study, but it certainly is a good idea to see how she uses a passage. And Ellen White does quote from Psalm 46. You might find great help in some things she has to say about it. But your homework has to do with themes. Hey, young disciples, we've gone to the end of our time. Thank you for listening. Don't forget that snake, that bull snake. Be sure that uh, you thank your parents for guarding your hole so that you, the baby squirrel, could make it. And have pity on the parents you know whose, whose children are dead already. And maybe you can show some sympathy to people that are suffering. Uh, let's have a closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, I'm asking that you would care for us, that you would teach us how to be as courageous as that squirrel, that you would teach us how to be as empathetic and sympathetic with people as the flycatcher and the chickadee. We're asking you to make us useful to yourself. And if we're going to suffer at the hands of the beast, would you please remind us of how you're going to win the war in the end? Give us courage to be faithful. We thank you for this gift, and I ask for it in the name of Jesus. Amen.